Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program and Happy New Year. It's an exciting time to be a real estate investor, but so much is changing. Today, we're going to take a little different tact as we start a new year and discuss defensive strategies you can implement as a real estate investor and beyond. Today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Registration is now open for the Real Estate Guys 20th Annual Investor Summit. Imagine spending an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Returning in 2022, the editor of the Gold Newsletter, Brian London, international real estate developer, Beth Clifford, the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, G. Edward Griffin, Jim Rohn's 18-year business partner, Kyle Wilson, and the rebel capitalist, George Gammon. And joining us live and in person for his 10th Investor Summit, best-selling author and the Rich Dad Advisor for Real Estate, Ken McElroy. Plus, lots more to be announced. It all begins June 10th, 2022 in beautiful Belize. Visit realestateguysradio.com and click the tab that says Summit to preserve your spot. Go to realestateguysradio.com, click Summit, and make plans to spend a week with the Real Estate Guys, George Gammon, Ken McElroy, and an all-star faculty on the 20th Annual Investor Summit on Sand. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Joining me as usual in the new year, it is Russell Gray. Hey, Russell. Hey, Robert. It's another uh, year together. Wow, this makes it a lot. <laughs> it's. Uh, I think this is entering my 18th year, I believe, as the co-host, so it's kind of crazy. That's a pretty long gig for the temporary co-host. That's, uh, that's yeah. awesome. Well, we uh, thought we'd do something different today, and uh, we've been talking a lot with a lot of smart folks about what's happening in the coming weeks. You'll hear some of our good friends predict what they see for the new year but there's a lot of change in the air there's just all kinds of things happening some are economic some aren't but they trickle over and what's an investor to do it's like being that proverbial long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs yeah we're printing money and inflation is great and everybody's home is worth more than it was but the value of the dollar is going down, and that means it's not really worth more. And and what what are we supposed to think? What are we supposed to do? So what we're going to do today is we don't have a crystal ball. We're not going to tell you where the market's going, but we are going to give you some great food for thought in terms of defensive investing strategies. A lot of our lives, we spend our time on the offense. We're trying to find great deals. We're trying to find excellent markets. We want cash flow. We want equity growth. We want tax savings. We want all those things. And we have to go out and get those things. And that's playing offense. But there's also a time to play defense. And by defense, we don't mean sit on the sidelines in all cash. That's a defensive strategy, but that hasn't proven to work in the last couple of years. I would say there was just as much uncertainty in 2020, if not more, than we see today. And yet, if you sat out the real estate market or the stock market in mid-2020, you missed a lot. So what we're going to talk about today is some ideas of things you can do that can keep you in the market, but also help you play defense. And I think a great way to illustrate that, we're right here in uh, the start of playoff season and football, Russ, and maybe there's some analogies there. Yeah, well, I mean, I had a little tiny stint playing a little bit of high school football and one year of college football. I wasn't any good, but I love the game. And one of the things that I would hear all the time is if they don't score, you, we can't lose. Of course, if you don't score, you can't win. And, and so offense and defense are both part of the game. And then a lot of times the difference maker is the special teams. And to kind of bring that over to what we're talking about, offense is obviously building wealth, building cash flow, getting out there on the margin, pushing it, stretching the field, if you will, to use a football analogy. Defense is really about uh, holding the line, making sure you preserve your wealth, making sure that you are prepared to weather the offensive, if you will, of the adversary coming against you. You know, life is full of challenges. And that's a good thing because it means that the people who can attack those challenges and solve those problems have real opportunity. Every entrepreneur's dream is to have problems every day. Uh, if you think about it the right way, special teams are all of those in between those transitional times. You know, in, the, in football, it's kicking and punting and all of that. In investing, I would say it's probably things like uh, tax strategy, asset protection, uh, estate planning, how you're going to mitigate some of the risks that come maybe through your insurance policies and good business practices, things like that. So those aren't really center mass to going out there and trying to figure out how you're going to grow your wealth or increase your passive income or how you're going to protect yourself from foreclosure or 
uh, or any of those kind of things, but it's a very, very important part of the game. And so in order to be a complete football team, you have to play all three areas of the game. In order to be a complete investor, I think you need to pay attention to all three areas of the game, if you will. Robert Kiyosaki talks about how sophisticated investors can make money when the market's going up, when the market's going down, or when the market's going sideways. Most investors, and not just real estate investors, most investors in general, only think about the market going up. How can I corner this crypto or this stock or this neighborhood? And real estate's the long game. And so today we're going to give you a snapshot of some ideas. Now, what we have done many times over the course of our 20 five years on the radio is near the beginning of the year, we do kind of a strategies for the new year show. And we're not going to do that this year, but in the archives, we have a lot of those shows. So the things you were talking about, Russ, reviewing your insurance policies, making sure your coverages are up to date, your beneficiaries are right, going over your mortgages and looking at, are, are you optimizing? All the things that we talk about on those shows, you can go find. Today, what we want to do is give you some ideas about how to be on the defense a little bit. Understanding, we're not saying get out of the game. So the first thing is I think to narrow your focus into bread and butter real estate, proven markets, places you have relationships, strong fundamentals, stay away from that stuff on the margin. Often we get like a, a buzz on a new market. We find a market no one's talking about yet and we get in early. That could be awesome. We've done that several times in our career. It's paid off. But now may not be the time. And if you're thinking about defense more than offense, you want to hit the base hits. Equity can be intoxicating. It's just quick wealth. And when it's equity that happens, in other words, you didn't create it. It's just the market doing what the market does in boom times. You can feel like you are a brilliant investor. And of course, we know from experience, the market can turn right around and humble you very quickly. So uh, I don't think that we're suggesting that we stop looking for opportunities to build equity, I, I think far from it. I think you want to really focus on things that you have more direct control over. You know, you, you might try to pick a hot market. You might try to pick a right interest rate swing. You might try to pick a right demographic shift, a migration pattern. And all those things are very, very important. You want to do that. And there's a lot of that happening right now. We see states that are hemorrhaging people and other states that are winning. I think you don't have to be a rocket scientist to look at the states that are growing versus the ones that aren't and try to understand what's behind that, why, what's motivating people and businesses to move. But none of those things are really under your control. Those are things you have to look at and you have to guess right, make an educated guess, speculate, hypothesis, whatever you want to call it. But it is a bet. It's a bet that you read the tea leaves correctly. And I'm not saying you shouldn't place those bets, but if you're buying properties where there is an opportunity to create value because it's undermanaged, it's in bad condition, uh, something that you have direct control over, uh, I think that is a bit of a defensive posture. It's a way to play offense, but defensively, going again, going back to the football analogy, you know, you can try to stretch the field and throw the long bomb and try to get behind the defense and go down the field, gallop down the field 30, 40, 50 yards at a time. Or you can just run the ball. You can just run the ball and get three, four, five yards every single play. Just keep banging that, they call pounding the rock, uh, moving the chains and eating up the clock and not letting the other person score on you. And I, I'm, I'm saying that from a real estate investing perspective, it's probably smart to be thinking about just fundamental, basic execution, doing things that are under your control. And to your point, Robert, staying a little bit off some of the more speculative margin, uh, because that is maybe run its course a little bit and it, it could pull back. And if you're betting on something going from its highest high to its next highest high, and instead it retreats to 10% of its recent high, that can be very painful if you're out there on the margin. If you're inside, you know, way inside your game, it doesn't matter that much. So we talk about a market that's proven. That's a market where there's a lot of folks, where there's a demand for housing. And to your point, Russ, the other thing we look at is tenant landlord law. How friendly is a jurisdiction to landlords? Now, that's something we always talk about. There are just certain states and certain countries where the government decides to support tenants more than they support landlords or vice versa. Obviously, as real estate investors, we're big proponents of being in places where our money is loved and appreciated and that the tenant landlord law favors the landlord. If the tenant doesn't pay, they have a reasonable amount of time and then they have to move. Now, that's been exacerbated with the eviction moratoriums. So follow me on this. 
The value of your property doesn't matter very often. It matters when you buy it, it matters when you sell it, and it might matter when you refinance it. But if I own an apartment building and my tenants are paying and I have a fixed mortgage rate, then I don't worry too much about fluctuation in the market. If I'm day trading stocks, I worry a lot about fluctuation in the market. So as long as I have a solid tenant base and a good property management team, I'm in, I'm good, I'm making a return. Over time, what inflation does is increases the rents. Meanwhile, my tenants are paying the mortgage down. So that's all good. But there are certain places that we can go back over the last 18 months and watch and see how those places treated landlords. So for instance, the eviction moratoriums at first when COVID happened, they were everywhere. And then in certain places, they lifted them sooner than others. That's a clue. Yeah, I think, you know, we say all the time, you don't know who your friends are, who your friends really are until you've been through pressure together. And pressure is what causes people to manifest. You know, you kind of get a chance to see who people really are. And I think it's a wonderful thing. I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit. This isn't meant to be a political statement, but we're talking about policies. We're talking about a government that is making decisions about how they're going to implement or react in any type of a situation. Uh, usually when we talk about landlord tenant law, it's kind of buried way beneath the headlines and nobody ever gets a chance to see it. And it's kind of anecdotal and you have to kind of be in the business to see it. But today it's really been very visible. If you look at the three fastest growing population states, they're Florida, Arizona, and Texas. And they tend to have something in common, the way they think, the way they act, the way they, they treat their citizens, the way they treat their businesses. Now, I'm not saying that's why they're the fastest growing, but those are th something that those three states have in common. The three states that are hemorrhaging people the fastest, that are bleeding out the most people are California, New York, and Illinois. Those three states have a way of doing business. And again, you can do your own analysis and, and you need to take that kind of that, that hypothesis about, gee, is, is this place friendly or is it not friendly to what I want to do and who I want to be? That's a personal decision. You have to think about it. And then you have to marry that to some anecdotal uh, information. Now, fortunately, we get a chance to talk to lots of real estate investors. We, we have uh, you know visibility into a lot of different markets anecdotally because we talk to a lot of people. And I was talking to a guy the other day uh, who lives in Illinois, uh, but he invests in Indiana. And the reason he does that is because everybody's leaving Illinois and moving to Indiana. We, we've done a show about that in the past. That's the type of thing that's that's happening. Some of the hottest real estate markets have been the markets we've been talking about, been visiting in Florida, in, in some of these marketplaces that we've been talking about for a while. So I, I'm not saying that we got it right for the right reason, but I think we, we largely got it right. So you have to figure out the reasoning if it makes sense to you. But those are the types of things you have to really think about. And I think that we're actually, it's very fortunate that we've been in a situation where we've gotten a chance to see under extreme, very extreme pressure, how state governments, city and, and county governments, and businesses in various areas are responding to this type of pressure. And then it helps us make a decision about where we think we want to be. And we also get a chance to see how the people react. Because at the end of the day, you may agree or disagree, but if people are moving and they're taking their earnings and they're taking their, their rental demand and their housing demand from one market to another market, then you have to pay attention to that, whether you agree with the reasons they're doing it or not. I mean, it doesn't matter. The fact is it's happening and that's what you have to pay attention to. There's a lot of craziness in the air. We're talking today about defensive investment strategies. We've got a big list. More when we come back, you're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Live nationwide, you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. In uncertain times like this, it's great to know there are two things you can always count on. High demand for affordable single-family homes to live in and Terry Kerr's amazing Memphis team at Mid-South Home Buyers to find, fix, and manage the next addition to your recession-resistant real estate portfolio. The Memphis market is logistics and distribution dynamo with an economic engine that's essential to moving goods and critical supplies all over the United States. Quality rehab, proven profitable property management, affordable rents, and solid ROI make turnkey property investing through Terry's team a dream when it matters most. To learn more about Memphis and Mid-South Home Buyers, send an email to midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. That's midsouth at realestateguysradio.com.
If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the Secrets of Successful Syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Hello, everybody. Uh, David Stockman. Uh, I'm the author of the Contra Corner blog, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show, and Happy New Year to you. If you want to come hang out with The Real Estate Guys, check out our events page. If you go to realestateguysradio.com, there's a tab that says events. It's lots of places that will be. Some are other people's events that uh, they're kind enough to invite us to speak at. Some are our events where we invite other people to speak, but they're all places that will be in the new year and we hope to see you there. We're talking about defensive strategies, just a way of thinking a little differently. Rather than always be looking for the next great market and being on the upswing, let's also be prudent. In the stock market, they call it profit taking. That means the stocks were down. And the idea is people, well, I bought this stock, it went up, so I sold it to preserve my gain. Now, the big challenge with stock investing is that's a taxable event. Check with your tax professional. In real estate, the market moves slower, so we can't jump in and out of markets or in and out of property. So we have to think a little more strategically. And using the sports analogy, you know, when a team is approaching a game and they have another team, they don't just run the same playbook. They study that other team. Kind of to your point earlier, Russ, is that every place is a little different. Every team's a little different. And if you are thinking about moving around, maybe right now you're owning property in some of those states where it's been revealed to you that they are not supportive of landlords and you're thinking about moving that money. What well, could be a strategic time to do that? So what are some things you need to be thinking about in terms of those defensive strategies? If you're looking at a new market, I'm going to say a defensive strategy is a primary market. So one of the top 50 MSAs, a lot of industrial and professional and commercial and institutional investors only play in the top 20 or 40 or 50 metropolitan statistical areas. Many times, you know, street rats like us, we find opportunity in those lesser known markets and that can work well. But in a time where you're feeling like you need to be in the defense, I think a primary market is going to beat a secondary or even tertiary market. Yeah, well, you know, you and I both came out of the San Francisco Bay Area way, way back. And what we saw as Silicon Valley boomed is that the people who weren't part of that tech boom were getting priced out. And yet they still wanted to live in the area. And so they ended up, if you're familiar with the Bay Area, moving out of you know, Marin County or uh, Alameda County or Santa Clara County or San Mateo County, the major counties around the Bay. And they ended up moving out into the Central Valley. They ended up moving up into Sacramento. They ended up moving into the secondary and tertiary markets that were nearby. Robert, you saw that coming and you took us up into Sacramento right before it became the top appreciating market in the country. And a lot of that was driven by Bay Area demand. People had been priced out. I know I have many friends that moved out of the Bay Area and went up there. Uh, the people who went to places like the Central Valley, they were out there in Tracy and Modesto, and they were commuting in you know, an hour and a half, two hours in because the jobs were in Silicon Valley, but the affordable housing was further out. Boy, as soon as those prices came back down, they moved back in, right? Yeah. They didn't They didn't stay out there. And so you have to be careful. It's the same thing we saw in North Dakota when the big Bakken oil boom came. You know, nobody was living in North Dakota. And then all of a sudden, everybody wanted to go to North Dakota. And there was a huge housing shortage. And people were living in their trailers. And it was big opportunity, demand for housing. Rents were going through the roof. And people thought, oh, you should go invest there. You should go invest there. And we just said, well, you know, what happens if that demand for housing, that oil boom, pulls back, then that demand, it's going to take the demand with it. And because it was a one trick pony town, you know, again, talking about what a tertiary market is, the only reason people are there is because of some external event over which you don't have any control. If that event turns on you, if it changes 
and people weren't there before, there weren't a lot of other reasons for them to be there, then they come back out again. Which, by the way, is exactly what happened. And I don't know if you remember this, but you and I were at Robert Kiyosaki's house talking to some good friends of his that are friends of ours in the oil business. And you specifically asked the attorney for the oil company, right? You guys are going crazy there. Tell me this, are those jobs permanent? And he looked at us and said, no. A few of them are. Most of them are not. Yeah, you're building out all the infrastructure and getting all the wells built. And then after that, it, it, it takes a lot less people. And then the, the other question is, how long do those wells last? You know, so again, not knowing anything about the oil business, I had to ask somebody who understood the business because I didn't know what I was looking at. And I think in terms of a defensive strategy, just to go off on a little tangent, is you got to stay within what you understand. And what you understand isn't just what you understand, but it's who you have access to that can give you a straight answer that isn't a biased answer. Like we happen to be friends with this guy in the oil business. And I knew if I asked him the question, he didn't have a horse in the race. He wasn't going to tell me anything other than the truth because he had no reason to. So I knew I was getting, you know, at least his honest assessment. There, you know, there could have been other perspectives and you'd have to pursue those as well. But stay within investments and markets that you really have a legitimate chance of understanding accurately because it's when you get out there and you're 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 speculating and you're guessing and you're taking chances that's where this type of a market can be very dangerous now let's talk about another defensive strategy and that is really sharpening your pencil in terms of prudent underwriting when the markets are going crazy and prices are going up 11 or 18 or 22 percent a year like they are in markets right now it's easy to get lazy and say well you know what's the worst that can happen it's going to be negative for a little bit but it's going to go up and value and make up for it well if we're thinking about defense again the premise is i've owned lots of property in down markets and as long as my tenants are paying and my mortgage is set i'm good i'm not panicking about it because i'm a collector of real estate so if you're just a little more prudent let me give you an example. Single family houses today are getting bid up sometimes way over the appraised value. And this happens a lot, but it's happening right now in a lot of markets because there is a homeowner willing to pay that price. Yeah, it's not going to appraise and I'm going to have to bring more cash to the table and the lender's not going to meet the LTV, but I want the house. This is where I want to live. That mentality does not serve you as a real estate investor. And yet you'd think investors would be a lot more disciplined, but I watch it happen, especially in multifamily, which is super hot right now. There's a lot of great folks teaching multifamily, new people coming into multifamily and cap rates are compressing as bad as ever, unless you go way out into tertiary markets and take more risk. And so when that happens, you just have to hold the line. You are going to be tempted to overbid, especially because prices have gone up and inflation has taken hold. But now is when you have to be careful. Yeah, well, I mean, then there's a distinction, I think, that needs to be made between residential and multifamily. In, in residential, it's driven by homeowner demand and their ability based on their income and based on their mortgage rates to be able to bid the property up beyond anything that would make sense on an income coverage perspective. And so when you are tempted to dive in and overpay for a property in that, number one, you're going to be easily able to do it because that's the nature of the beast is the lenders will lend according to value and your ability to pay personally. So you're going to be tempted to do it for that reason. Or you're going to be able to do it for that reason. You're going to be tempted to do it because, again, as I said earlier, equity is intoxicating. I, I mean, when you see properties going up fifty, hundred thousand dollars a year, it's hard to just say, "Well, gee, how do I not do that?" If I buy the property, it could go up a hundred thousand, and it might, but it could easily go the other way. And that's the point when you're at the edge. When you go to multifamily, yes, you can overpay, but it's harder. You, you have to overpay by either bringing in more down payment, being very, very thin on your cash flows, your reserves. The lender, assuming you have a lender involved and you should, is going to underwrite that according to the income. And they're going to they're gonna really look at that property. So there's a little bit more safety. It's a very different game. For those of you that only think of real estate investing as housing, as you know, single family houses or even residential one to four housing, it's going to be easier to overpay 
the apartment game is a little bit different. Make sure if you've never done it before, you have a great mentor or somebody who is a, a partner that has, has done that before that can help you. But your lender is going to be your friend in, in that environment, even though it doesn't always feel like it because you're desperately trying to overpay because you're all caught up in the moment. And they're going to they're gonna tone you down a little bit because they, they view you more as a partner than maybe a residential lender does. Yeah, that's such a good point. Hey, one more. We'll take a break and then we're going to come back with maybe our favorite defensive strategy of all. But you just talked to us about the fact that many investors view investing in real estate as residential. One of the great things to invest in are triple net leases, which are typically commercial. They could be an office building. It could be retail. It could be a ton of different things, single tenant leases, those kinds of things. And one of the ways to be defensive is to go for the credit tenant. Now, if you've never been in commercial property, a credit tenant is someone that has the wherewithal and credit to be an excellent bet. Think of an A-rated credit tenant. So it's the difference between leasing my retail center to Joe's Java Shack or Starbucks, right? That's the difference. As you know that come heck or high water, Starbucks is gonna make their rent payment to you and you're gonna be able to make your mortgage payment. Joe's Java Hut, who knows, right? Who, Who knows? So a lot of times we'll take a flyer, we'll take a risk on a tenant. We have a commercial building. We put a tenant in that we just desperately really wanted for a lot of reasons. Gave him a sweet deal. It's turned out to work in our favor very well. We did what's called a percentage lease. And typically we think of a percentage lease as an escalation, you know, some bare minimum amount of rent. And if your sales go high, Mr. Retail Tenant, you're going to pay us a percentage of that. This was a straight percentage lease which meant there was very little downside to the tenant, but a lot of upside to both him and us, and it's worked out great. So what you want to consider if you're thinking about commercial property or even certain residential property is a longer term lease than you're used to writing. And again, that's going to be in the context of your tenant landlord law, a credit tenant, and then consider a master lease. There's a lot of different master lease options available. We had a building for a lot of years that had eight units, but it was rented by an organization. They were a nonprofit. They guaranteed the rent. They paid the rent on the first of the month every single month for years, and they took the risk of putting tenants in that were subsidized for different reasons. So that's a whole can of worms. That could be two shows. But just think about a master lease. And the reason I bring those things up, long-term leases, credit tenants, master leases, is they are defensive strategy. Those things are going to be less open to changes and fluctuations and quick moves in the market. We're talking about defensive strategies in your investing portfolio. We've got lots more. Plus, we'll play real estate trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Elms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. Hey, it's Robert Helms. Thanks so much for listening to the show today. I want to personally invite you to come see an amazing real estate market that combines excellent cash flow, offshore diversification, and what we affectionately call lifestyle investing. Come join me from April 1st to 4th in the beautiful country of Belize. The Real Estate Guys have been bringing investors to Belize for more than 15 years now, and our discovery trip is designed to show you the market like nobody else can. Sure, Belize is breathtakingly beautiful, the people are wonderful, and wait till you taste the food. But the real opportunity is the real estate investment potential. Demand for offshore real estate has skyrocketed since the coronavirus shutdown, and with retirees looking for lifestyle, the work from home workforce able to be productive from afar, and tourism coming back strong, now may be the perfect time to consider Belize as a place to diversify risk in your investment portfolio. There's all types of opportunity in Belize when it comes to real estate investing, including both long and short-term rentals, commercial and retail triple net properties, business opportunities, land acquisition, development, agriculture, and more. And as the only country in Latin America with English as its official language, it's easy to understand the law. Property rights are strong and contracts are in English. And in Ambergris Key, a unique situation exists where demand for rentals continues to outstrip supply, creating a compelling environment for investors. So come see for yourself. Join me in April in Ambergris Key, Belize, as we study the market, learn about the sustainable drivers, and tour lots of beautiful real estate. And like all our field trips, there are no properties for sale during the weekend, 
Rather, you'll meet lots of local providers that will help educate you about the market so that you can follow up with them after the trip if the market is interesting to you. You've heard about Belize and the Real Estate Guys for all these years? Now come see what the excitement is all about. Plus, we'll have lots of time over meals and activities to talk about all things real estate. To get the details, go to the website of realestateguysradio.com and click on Events, where you'll find the Belize Discovery Trip. Once you register, you'll get information about our group hotel rates as well as travel details. So join me in Belize April 1st through 4th. It's a beautiful country with lots of amazing possibilities, and the only thing missing is you. Go to realestateguysradio.com under events, and I look forward to seeing you in beautiful Belize. Hi, this is Peter Schiff, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. Hey, if you want to hang out with The Real Estate Guys, check out where we'll be this year. Just go to realestateguysradio.com under events. If you're enjoying this program on defensive real estate strategies, next week we'll be talking about some practical things you could do to prepare, come what may. Before we get back to today's discussion, it's time to play real estate trivia. That's your chance to win a prize by knowing today's real estate trivia question. As soon as you hear it and think you know the answer, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. First person that gets it right gets a copy of an awesome book called Purpose, Passion, and Profit, a collection of phenomenal stories put together by our friend Kyle Wilson. That could be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question. Last show was an Ask the Guy show when we asked you this. Where was the coldest temperature on Earth recorded in the last 50 years? Well, Dome Fuji, Antarctica, reached a temperature of negative 93.2 Celsius in August of 2010. When this dry, cold desert was declared the coldest place on Earth, beating the previous record at the Vostok Research Station in Antarctica, which had stood since 1983. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. A new day, and a new year for that matter, starts at the International Date Line. When was it established? Yeah, we all know about the International Date Line. It kind of zigs and zags, and that's where the new day starts. Well, when was the International Date Line established? If you know or just want to take a guess, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. First person that gets it right gets purpose, passion, and profit. That's today's real estate trivia question. We're talking today about defensive real estate strategies. We're all for playing offense, but playing defense is important. Defense wins games. It's true in baseball. It's true in basketball. I don't know about golf. But it's certainly true in football. So we're talking about some ideas today on, on ways you can be defensive. And, and one of our favorite ones is protecting your equity using something we call equity stripping. So we're going to toss this one to the financial strategist. Yeah, well, I mean, the traditional term equity stripping is really uh, putting a lien on a property that has equity so that um, so that so a predator like a lawsuit or somebody a, somebody who has a judgment can't get in front of you. Which is a defensive strategy. Which is definitely a defensive strategy. And that's when you think that you're in a situation where you, you, you may be subject to litigation or some form of asset seizure or something like that. But I think really, Robert, what you're talking about is the idea of actually getting the equity out of the property while it's there. And, you know, obviously that's a cash out refinance. That's what you want to do. You want to take advantage of the fact that we got these ridiculous ridiculously low interest rates, you have the ability to lock them in for the long terms. And if you've got good credit uh, and a plan for making the payment, then it, why not take the equity? Because if the market takes the equity, it, it's gone and it's not retrievable. If the credit markets collapse or your borrowing power disappears for whatever reason, then that equity is trapped. You can't get to it. So if you have the opportunity to get to it and it's there, I say go get it because it's cheap. All you have to do is beat the interest rate. And that's what we talk about arbitrage. If I can borrow out at three or four or 5%, which I can easily do today, and I can invest that at five, six, seven, eight percent which I can easily do today, then even if I just did that, I create a little bit of positive cash flow. I separate my equity from the property. Uh, and then if you marry that to an estate plan or an asset protection plan or even a tax 
plan uh, or all three, there can be some creative things you can do. And of course, we have lots of things we can do once we freed the cash up. But the key is, is to get the cash out, to get liquid. It's always good to be liquid. You know, we laugh about that January interview we did where I got a chance to ask Donald Trump what he learned in the good times and what he learned in the bad times. This was way before he was President Mr. Controversial Donald Trump. He was just real estate mogul Donald Trump. And, uh, and I've told the story many times, but it was such a great blunt answer because I didn't learn anything in the good times. But what I learned in the bad times is always good to have a little cash. Well, this is the point. A defensive strategy when you're sitting on gobs of equity and lending is loose as it is right now, if you have the opportunity to get liquid, you don't have to give up the property. You don't have to give up the upside of the property, the income, the tax breaks of the property. You don't have to give any of that up. And you don't have to negatively impact your cash flow because it's so easy to beat the cost of borrowing and create positive cash flow on the borrow. So you just have to be willing to do it and then pay attention to it. So it's not that complicated, but it's something to definitely be thinking about arguably the most important thing anybody with a portfolio right now should be doing. In fact, we had Stephanie Riley do a report on how to get cash out. And uh, if you want to see that report, it's cash out at realestateguysradio.com. She's a fantastic consultant in terms of really helping people understand how to preserve their equity by using this very strategy. It is a great strategy. So I think the action item in the new year for you is to take a look at each property that you have and decide is there some equity here that I want to move? I want to reposition. I want to do something else with. Not only does it give you an opportunity to do that, but it also protects the equity in the property because the market giveth and the market taketh away. And that kind of transitions into the next one, which is just a holistic look at your financing on your properties. Rates are still low. Loans are still available. A defensive strategy is to tune up your portfolio from a financial point of view and say, are there some new loans I should get into? Should I refinance this property? Maybe it's not even a cash out. It's just a change of rate and terms. We get lazy landlord syndrome. We have a property. It's been working fine and our interest rate's six and a quarter and we didn't bother to refinance it because who wants to go through that hassle? Well, a defensive strategy is get your costs down and sit with your mortgage professional and look at your entire portfolio. Another thing that uh, makes sense for some investors is when they get to a number of units, not just because they're Fannie or Freddie'd out, it might make sense to look at a loan that would be a blanket encumbrance. A lot of reasons to do that, and that's a protective strategy too. So I, I think one of the things when you think about this idea of being defensive, a lot of people, when we get to where they sense there may be a bit of a bubble in the market... I don't know where this advice comes from because it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, but I see it all the time. And that is the idea to start paying down your mortgage right. or to refinance to like a 15 year instead of a 30 year. And you end up with a bigger payment and a bigger obligation or to put more equity into the property by making prepayments. And it just, none of that makes any, any sense. We, I could do a whole tirade show just on that because I can show you mathematically and I can show you all the reasons why that doesn't make any sense. But if you're inclined to do that, the idea that you don't want to just go buy more real estate into a bubble, but you've got extra cash flow or you freed up some equity in a property and rather than use it for a down payment on the next property, you could do something as simple. Instead of paying an extra thousand dollars a month on your mortgage, take a thousand dollars a month and buy silver or buy gold or buy, buy crypto, buy whatever it is you think is going to hedge well, be liquid, and it's equity on your balance sheet, but it's not in the property. You don't have to qualify to access it. If the real estate bubble, I, I don't like to say pops because equity doesn't ever completely disappear. It just goes away temporarily. So it just, we, we say the equity bubble passes some gas and then it gets reflated. That's usually the way it works. But during that period of time, and you want to be liquid in something that won't be affected by that, then you can look at other things. Cash is not a bad place to be, by the way. You know, again, it, it, I don't know that it's the only place you would want to have your liquidity. I like having cash, gold, silver, maybe some crypto. I'm starting to explore that. So the idea is that you have things that are on your balance sheet that are not in the property as a way to store your equity. And then if you build up enough of that and you have the ability to extinguish a loan on a property, if you need to, now, you may not need to, and you probably would never want to if it's cheap money, but if you ever needed to, 
then you have that available. It's, it's really tough if you have a lot of equity in property A and you're trying to pay off property B and to get that equity from A to B, that's hard to do, especially in an environment where you can't get loans. But but when you have your liquidity outside of the real estate, now, now you can. You have that equity outside the real estate and it's liquid. So precious metals is a great tool to do that with, in my opinion. Well, and as a defensive strategy, it's diversity. I mean, you know, the, the classic financial planner sits down and talks with you about your risk assessment and a diversified portfolio. At the macro level, I believe that too much diversification is a recipe for mediocrity. If I just do a little of that and a little of that and some stocks and some bonds and some oil and some gas and some of these companies and those companies, and pretty soon I have a very boring, very average return. But you could argue that it's diverse. What you're talking about with precious metals, Russ, is I think a really great strategy as a defense to protect what you've already made. So we don't think that metals are an investment because they don't pay an ROI typically. And that's a whole nother show. <laughs> and you can go in the archives. We've done some of those shows. But what it does give you is a lot of flexibility. And if you're new to precious metals, Russ put together an amazing series with our friend Dana Samuelson, who is a very seasoned precious metals dealer. And it's our Silver Series. If you send an email to Silver Series at realestateguysradio.com, you get a link to all those episodes. Worth watching, a great introduction. And even sophisticated metals investors are going to pick up some good stuff. And it's all free, so check that out. But whether it's precious metals or crypto. Crypto's outside of the banking system and the finance system. That's pretty attractive about it. The idea is if I'm thinking about defense, I want to have a lot of different moves available to me. So I like both those things. We're talking about defensive strategies for real estate investors. We've got some more. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. For thousands of years of human history, silver has been recognized as money. But then in 1965, the United States took silver out of the financial system. But did silver stop being money? Smart investors don't think so. And ever since, when there are concerns about the quality of the currency, alert investors seek shelter in silver and gold. As the size and frequency of major financial crises grow, silver is attracting a lot of attention. To help better understand the what, why, and how of silver, watch the free nine-part series, Making Sense of Silver. Everything you always wanted to know about silver but didn't know to ask. Featuring 30-year precious metals veteran Dana Samuelson. Send your email request to Silver Series at realestateguysradio.com. Whether you own silver now or you're wondering if it's too late, email Silver Series at realestateguysradio.com. Hey, ever wished you could go back in time and do some tax planning? Now you can, just like Marty McFly. Lucky for you, a brand new federal law just made this possible with an EQRP to get tax deductions and reduce your taxable income from last year so you can use that tax savings to invest in real estate, Bitcoin, gold, even your own business. Whether you're a full-time investor, doctor, government employee, even if you have five or 50 employees, the EQRP works and is your secret weapon and now it's retroactive. Hey, I'm Damian Lupo and we have your solution. By the way, if you got bad advice and used an IRA for an apartment syndication, you are sitting on a U-bit time bomb. But don't worry, there's a solution, the EQRP. The EQRP company is ready to help you get control of your money, kill U-bit, and help you pay way less taxes. Want to learn more about this strategy? Send an email to eqrp at realestateguysradio.com for my special EQRP report. Paying tax or letting Wall Street suck you dry is dumb. Your first step is freeing your retirement money by sending an email to eqrp at realestateguysradio.com today. Hi, I'm G. Edward Griffin, author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, a second look at the Federal Reserve. And you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. Hey, come join me in beautiful Belize. We've got our next Belize discovery trip on the calendar. It's the first weekend of April. All the details on the website at realestateguysradio.com under events. We love to play offense. Today we're talking about playing defense and defensive investing strategies. There's just so much uncertainty today. And you know what? The markets could all go up for another year or two or five. But as our friend Simon Black says, if you make some prudent moves so that you're protected in the downtimes and there aren't any downtimes, you're really not any worse off. Like 
Just take the time to consider some of these things. And I think one of the ways that we can play defense is to get exposures to markets and property types and so forth where we don't have to carry the burden. And you hear us talk about it on the show all the time, but we love real estate syndication, private placements, a place I could go put passively $50,000 into a deal that gets me exposure to multifamily or a great operator or residential or assisted living or the list goes on and on, agriculture. And so I think syndication is a great way to reduce some risk and gain market exposure. Yeah, we're big fans of Gary Keller's book, The One Thing. And the focusing question is, what is the one thing that I can do that makes everything else either easier or unnecessary? And the idea is you're looking for a move that brings a lot of leverage. It's not financial leverage, but it's just a lot of leverage in terms of advancing a lot of agendas or what we call checking a lot of boxes. And the reason that we're raving fans of syndication is it just checks a lot of boxes. If you don't have a million, two million, five million dollars of investable money, it's really hard to create meaningful diversity in real estate Yeah, because the properties just cost too much. And so a lot of times you're very exposed. Uh, but the idea of syndication means you can take a small piece of a lot of different deals. And so it checks that box. The other thing is you can create different outcomes depending on what you're doing. You can create tax breaks. You can create preservation of wealth. You can create cash flow. You can create equity growth. Uh, you, in some cases, can create a personal use component. We've invested where we end up with vacation properties and, and we get the, the personal use of enjoying uh, those properties, as, even though they're investments, not like a timeshare, which is really an expense. And so it, it checks that box, gives you the opportunity to build relationships with people that are active in the space. It's always good to know lots of people that have deal flow, that have access to capital, other investors, advisors, advice, anecdotal information, you know, boots on the ground contacts. Again, the list goes on and on and on. And of course, that checks a whole bunch of boxes just all within itself. It, when you hear us go on and on and why we've made syndication such a big part of our world post-2008, everything that we learned coming out of 2008 is is you, you're you watching us live that out every day. Everything we're talking about and the reason we're talking about it right now is because we've seen this movie. We know what this feels like. We know what it's like when when you get to the end and it's starting to be. I'm, I'm looking at an article right now. It says, home ownership dreams of Zoomers and millennials shattered by prices. When it gets to the point where the prices have gotten to the point where people just can't afford it, real wages are not going up faster than the cost of housing in spite of low interest rates and in spite of the fact that wages are going up and we have a tight labor market, in spite of all those things real estate is starting to have demand side pressure to the negative. In other words, people just can't afford it, right? They, the demand can't come. And I don't know how low, much lower mortgage rates could really go. And then you've got the Fed now hinting that, and again, we'll see, I'm not convinced that it's anything more than just talk, but we'll see, talking about raising interest rates and tightening money supply. And if all of those things start to happen, this is the time to be playing defense. And one of the best defensive strategies you can have is to go build a big network network of the right kind of people and diversify the wealth that you already have and put yourself in a position to go build new wealth, not flying solo, but working with other people who are more experienced. Syndication checks all those boxes. And that's why we're such huge raving fans of it. Well, imagine this. If I am doing well in a marketplace, I like the marketplace. It's a mainstream market. It's proven. I've got a good team there just to get some exposure to another market rather than go through all that work that it took you to get into that market, into those relationships, into those properties. Now for fifty or $100,000, you can be in a completely new market with someone that's proven, someone who's been there and done it, maybe even more proven than you are. So we love it from the passive investing side. There's also a great opportunity opportunity and active investing, becoming a syndicator. For many folks, they get to the point where they're fanny and freddied out. They can't get any more single family home loans or their eyes are bigger than their wallet. They're just kind of done with investing. So they sit on the sidelines or they decide to be the investment channel for all the passive people that are looking to put money to work. And this is, I think, an excellent time. When there's uncertainty, now you have investors looking to you if you have that experience, if you have those relationships. So I think the active side of real estate syndication is also a defensive strategy. Yeah, well, I think, you know, as we're having this conversation, Robert, it's occurring to me that we probably got some people listening that are among that four and a half million people that just quit their jobs. 
And, you know, they call it the great resignation. There's been pressure because people are being forced or coerced to make personal health decisions that they aren't in line with. Or again, they've seen a side of their employment situation that they don't like because we have all been under pressure and people manifest under pressure. And for whatever reason, people said, hey, I want to get out. They may be listening to this show thinking, hey, I need to find a way to make my balance sheet support me. I need to become financially independent based on my investing. I want to be a professional investor so I don't need to have a job again. Well, the fastest path to do that, obviously, is if you already have enough money to do it and just you know, if you've got three, $5 million and maybe you can pull that off, right? If you're not in that camp, then the, the next fastest way to do it is to start a business, helping people who are in that camp, put their money to work. And again, we see that happening for a lot of people. If you're the type of person that's been out there and you're accustomed to a six figure income, you're a manager, a professional salesperson, uh, you're an executive, maybe you've owned a small business, but you've been deemed non-essential, have issues, you know, decided, Hey, I don't, I don't feel like this is the place to be. Syndication can be a great business to to be in. And you talk about checking off the boxes and creating a lot of uh, relationships. You know, you walk into one of our secrets of successful syndication events, you're going to be in the room with nearly 300 people from all over the place doing all kinds of different deals. You're with them for two days. I mean, talk about compressing timeframes, learning a lot, meeting a lot of people. If you think you'd be interested in getting into the syndication business, you want to know what it's all about. We got our event coming up in, in March. Uh, you send an email to syndication at realestateguysradio.com. You can find out all about it. I believe it's the first weekend in March. But it's going to be great, and you can find out why we're so excited about it. It could be exactly the type of thing you're looking for at this season in your career with what's going on in the marketplace. It's designed to show seasoned investors how to take the next step in becoming a syndicator, but it's also a great event for passive investors to learn how to vet deals, and you'll meet a bunch of people doing them. So sounds like a shameless plug. Why not send an email to syndication at realestateguysradio.com and learn more? Our final defensive strategy, I think, is one of the most important things in your real estate investing life. And that is simply recognizing the importance of relationships. This is a numbers business. This is a tax business, but this is really a relationship business. And when times are tough, as you've been talking about Russ, that's when you know you are gonna rely on your strong relationships. So if you already have great relationships with people like your mortgage professionals and your property managers and your brokers and even your tenants, you want to nurture those relationships so that when things do go weird, whenever that is, you're in a much better position. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, people do business with people they know, like, and trust. And the more of those people you have in your life, the more opportunities you're going to have come your way. When you need a piece of advice, when you need help, when you need a partner, uh, when you need boots on the ground intel, uh, the list goes on and on and on. You know, we've spent a long time building a huge network and a decent brand so that we can pick up the phone and talk to just about anybody in this space. And it's powerful. It's great. It's been fantastic. And and it, it, our friends Chris Martinson and Adam Taggart uh, wrote a book called Prosper. And in there, they talk about these eight forms of capital. And one of the most important forms of capital in terms of being resilient is social capital, is your personal network. So we encourage you, however you choose to do it, maybe a good New Year's resolution would be to get yourself out there, meet more new people, find ways to add value and build out that network. Because uh, history says there's going to be a season coming up, maybe sooner rather than later when you're going to need to have those relationships and the time to get them in place is right now. People love to root for the home team and see them score a lot of points, but defense is a critical component of every game and certainly of real estate. So use this uh, show as a springboard to be thinking about how you can be on the offense, but also on the defense. Hey, speaking of our network of friends, we've reached out to a whole bunch of them. And coming up in a couple of weeks, we've got our predictions panel. Some of the smartest people we know are gonna give us their two cents on where they see things headed. Should be a great show. We've got a lot planned for this year. It's gonna be awesome. Until next week, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid South Home Buyers, low cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. 
Find these and other great companies under the Resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.